Thank you. <laughs> Welcome on the penultimate Sunday of winter. <laughs> it is good to see each of you here this morning as we gather to worship God. Just want to, uh, I have written down some announcements. Are there any announcements you need to make? Any particular one? When this is late? Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, there are a whole bunch of announcements on the blog. Uh, so you will want to check out those as well as in the bulletin. Belinda is passing out a announcement for the UMC of tomorrow, today. Uh, the speaker is J.J. Warren, uh, who's becoming a well-known youth leader in our denomination. Uh, he spoke at the 2016 uh, General Conference in Portland. And it made just a, a statement that I think will be felt in the denomination for years to come. Uh, First Church downtown is sponsoring uh, his coming to Boulder, and he'll be uh, speaking at the Wesley Foundation or on Folsom Street. So I look that up to you. And there uh, is a free lunch. Well, yes, they, they can read that. But I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, okay. food is involved. So. Um, and speaking of the book, sometime later this week, I'm thinking Thursday or Friday, we will post our 2,000 post the blog. So, so do check it out. So if there's nothing else, let's center ourselves as we come before God to worship.
Please stand and join me in the call to worship, followed by hymn number 139. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Should I fear anyone? The Lord is a fortress protecting my life.
we have purpose and have our being. Grant that what we have brought before you this morning isn't all we have, but a token of all that you have done in our life. Grant that as we do this thing, as we participate in this act of worship, we might be renewed and empowered to the work that you would have us do in this corner of your kingdom. We ask this in your son's name and in the presence of your spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We have a several joys and concerns that have come before us this morning. Uh, first, uh, the Glancies are thankful for Scott's healing of a broken leg. Oh. He is crutch free and race free. He can walk the dog around the block. <laughs> Back to chores. All right. Is he taking out the trash? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, some other joys and concerns. Uh, we lift up Sally today as she and her family are processing. Harry's death this past week. Uh, a service is being planned for Fort Logan National Cemetery in April. And we continue uh, to lift up uh, Skippy's family as they prepare their service for Skippy in April as well. We want to lift up uh, Sandy Cook uh, she is going to Kansas this week, uh, Greater Metropolitan, what did she call it? Coffee Bell, uh, to help with her mother's recovery process. So we want to lift up uh, Sandy as she makes that journey in for her mom who continues her healing. And we want to lift up Michelle. Uh, I don't know if most of you haven't heard, but she had dental surgery this past week, the type that they had to put her under. Mm -hmm. So she says uh, yesterday that it's like being hit in the jaw with somebody who knows how to put their weight behind it. <laughs> so she, uh, Steve, oh there, you want to say something about her? She's, she's doing well, her, her jaw hurts a lot. And she can't open her mouth very much, so she can't sing. So that's why she's not here. So we want to lift up uh, Michelle and Steve, who is learning all kinds of creative ways to blend things. <laughs> Soft diet. Lots of soup. Lots of soup. So if any of you have a special soup recipe that will help Michelle's healing, see Steve after the service. Uh, and I want to lift up, uh, tomorrow morning, I make the journey up to Cheyenne. Uh, I am on the Conference Board of Ordained Ministry. And each spring, we gather everybody who's in the process for ordination and conduct interviews. Now, we've done all kinds of processing before they get to this event. Two years ago, on Monday, we drove from all the four corners of the conference, had no idea what was about to happen. By Friday, Friday the 13th, the world had shut down. And I'm just, I'm kind of excited to be back among my fellow wizards. Uh, the, some of you are old enough to get that reference. <laughs> um, but it's, for some of these folks, well, for all of them actually, this is a process that takes years to accomplish. Uh, you don't just wake up one morning and think, ah, I'm going to be ordained. Not in our system. Uh, we have eight people who are going to be commissioned well, who are seeking commissioning, which means they're 
They've met, they've met with their local pastor or the pastor. They've met with the staff parish committee at their local church. They've been through the district committee on ministry. They've been processed. They've had psychological evaluations. They've had health evaluations. They've done all this paperwork. Now they come before the boom, the BOM, and get grilled. Who's love? Um, to see. And I always ask every time, why do you want to do this? There are easier ways to make a living. Why do you want to put yourself through this? And you know, we're not trying to trip people up, but it's kind of like being a, well, I'm not a parent, but I, that's not an analogy I can use. It's easy to say, I'm a dad, I'm a father, but it's harder to say I'm a dad. Those of you who have had that privilege. So there's eight people who are making that step. There are 10 people who were commissioned last year who are hoping to be allowed to continue the process. And as they learn, just because you have a Master of Divinity degree, there is no guarantee that you'll be ordained. That's just the educational requirement. There's a whole lot of other things. And then there's 10 people who are coming for the board hoping to be ordained in June, mm -hmm. an annual conference. And last year, three people came to the board and they were not ordained. They were continued for another year. And that's a conversation that's difficult to have. To tell someone, not yet. So, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, if you'll take 10 seconds, out of your day and ask for prayers for those coming before the board to be interviewed and for the board members that they will be guided with love. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I wanted to be on this committee or this board because I remember what it was like <laughs> and the nerves that you take when your life has been put on display for the world. So I please pray for just 10 seconds. You know, Lord, be with those being interviewed today and with those conducting the interview. Amen. If you say that, we'll really appreciate it. We want to continue to pray for the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, just the, well, there's not much that I can say that you haven't already seen on the news. I saw one art story of the Kiev Zoo, that the keepers, the staff, are sleeping with the animals to calm them down. How do you explain to a zebra or to a giraffe the bomb. this geopolitical conflict? I saw a picture of a woman carrying her elderly German shepherd across the Polish border. How do you explain to an animal that you have given your life to that you're going to leave them behind? So these are real people, not just statistics. superpower conflicts. So we want to continue to pray for the people being affected by this war. So I invite you to gather your thoughts to come before our God and pray. Gracious God, holy God, you who have given us life, help us. Help us who have received this gift to live as though we are alive. To show the world that we are not afraid to live to truly live in the presence of love. That we are willing to do the work of showing love in all of its amazing variety. 
But this is not an easy thing we have. It is easy for you to do. But we need your help. We know we should do it. We have seen it done. But it is not always easy for us to do. So we ask your spirit to be with us. To show us the way that leads to life. Gracious God, you have heard us sharing the things that are happening in our world. Things that are beyond our control. We hear what is happening to other people. People who are healing this day. People who are grieving this day. And we say, Lord, please be with them. Bless them. Lord, help us to be with them as well. Help us to bless them. That in blessing others, we might be blessed ourselves. Gracious God, loving God, This very day, mothers and fathers are grieving. Here in our very town, as well as across the battlefield of Ukraine. But there are other mothers and fathers who are grieving in Yemen, in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Congo. Those mothers and fathers matter too. Help us, Father, help us, Mother God, to be people who are willing to work for peace. That in so doing, we might live in the kingdom of God that your son said was near. We ask this in his name, in the power and presence of your spirit, offering that prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 13, starting with the 31st verse. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet yeah, today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way, because it is impossible to, for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord.
something about those, you know, that speak to us beyond the words. Have you ever thought that that hymn was new once? And somebody said, I have an idea. And someone else said, I don't know about that tune. <laughs> <laughs> well, this morning, reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians in the third chapter, we hear Paul speaking with a profound, deep, visceral love to a community that he had a, a personal connection to, longed for them to be more than just that group. He writes, join me in following my example, my sisters and brothers. Take as your guide those who follow the example that we set. Unfortunately, many go about in a way which shows them to be enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often said this to you before, this time I say it with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And their glory is their shame. I'm talking about those whose minds are set on the things of this world. But we have our citizenship in heaven. It's from there that we eagerly await the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ who will give a new form to this lowly body of ours and remake it according to the pattern of the glorified body by Christ's power to bring everything under subjugation. For these reasons, my sisters and brothers, you whom I so love and long for, who are my joy and my crown, continue, my dear ones, to stand firm in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. God. <clears throat> this idea that Paul is offering to this infant church that, oh, you are, you're on fire. You get it. You are engaging in the faith that we share with you as a personal witness to what we have believed. We did it, he says earlier in the letter, not because of who we are, even though he had the credentials. He had sat before the committee of the Pharisees and had been examined he had been found to be faultless in his zeal for God. And he said that it was nothing. It was insignificant compared to the glory that is available to us all. Not because of who we are, but because of who God is. And he said, you too can have this. In fact, he said, I know that you have this. I've seen it with my own eyes, and I've heard it with my ears, the testimony of others about you. But, some, some have said, yeah, God is great. Let's worship God. Let's, let's believe in Jesus. But let's do it in this space. <laughs> let's do it in this fashion. Let's do it because we're hoping for eternal life and to have a crown in the new Jerusalem. And while we're setting aside all that 
we can still have a good time. Now, this part of Paul's epistle, this letter that he writes from the heart, is not a you know, wagging a finger at them. He's saying, isn't this wonderful that you get the idea, you understand that there's more to the faith than mere belief. There's more than simply singing the hymns and the psalms and the sacred songs. He says that, that that's wonderful. It's wonderful to say you believe. But there's more. Don't let anybody take away the joy that is yours. You recognize that God loves you. When you can look in the mirror and say, yeah, you. You strange looking creature. God loves you. And then, having made that audacious claim, you wander the streets of your town, go to the market, get on Zoom, and say, you too. God loves you too. Now, Paul is speaking to a community in the city of Philippi. We've mentioned this before that this was a town that had been founded by Philip the Great of Macedonia. His son, Alexander, had made that the center of power of an empire that dominated the Eastern Mediterranean. But Paul is writing to a community that even with that pedigree was in fact a Roman occupied place. The city-states of Greece had long since been under the Roman Empire. They were no longer citizens of Macedonia. They were citizens of Rome. He said, that's great. It's great to be citizens of your country. It's good to have that heritage. So what? Time, he said, to be citizens of God's kingdom. It's time to renew your mind that you are living, not just in theory, not just with the, the trappings of religion or the, the practices of a local congregation, you are living as ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Now, many of you have a passport issued by the government of the United States of America. And the act of holding a passport is kind of a big deal historically. Mm -hmm. It means that your citizenship, your residency, in fact, your very worth is recognized by a nation state. And that holding that passport means that you have certain rights that other countries will respect. Now, that doesn't always happen, but in theory, it does. So Paul says to us, you have this passport. Now, I mean, they didn't have passports as we know them in the Roman Empire. 
But all you had to say was, I am a Roman citizen, and oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. That's all you had to say. I'm a citizen of the empire. And everyone knew, don't mess with this person. Because if you do, the weight of the empire will fall upon your pretty little head. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's great. It's great to have that status. But there's more. There's something that even the emperor can't give you. There's something that even the emperor can't take away from you. And that's life. Life that is offered to us, to each of us from the very hand of God. And he says, now that you've recognized this gift, it's time to exchange one passport for another. It's time to say, I'm not going to hold two passports. I'm not going to claim citizenship in two kingdoms. I'm going to offer my allegiance, my very life, in service to the kingdom of God. What Paul is writing to this church is a radical statement. Because if you claim king citizenship in God's kingdom, you're saying, I am no longer obligated. I am no longer committed to loyalty to another kingdom. Because you can't be a citizen of two kingdoms, of two ways of living. You can't say, I am a follower of Jesus, and then in the same breath say, Jesus be damned. He said, you can't do that. Why? Because in these letters, Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, in Galatia, in Philippi, in Ephesus, here's the gospel. I know it to be true, he said, because I've seen what it does in my life. I've seen that I have been transformed. That God took me as good as I was, and made me better. As strong as I was in the ways of my people, God has given me a new family. As amazing. All the things I've done in my life, they pale in significance to the life I now live in the name and in the presence of God. And Paul says, you too can have this. Follow my example. He is not saying, follow me. He's saying, follow my example because I follow the way of Christ. Early Christians, called followers of the way. The way of Christ. The way of life. The way of hope. He <clears throat> does not say that it's an easy thing. A lot of people <coughs> in our tradition begin the journey, feeling some prompting of the Spirit, and they feel ready. Maybe their grandmother, maybe their Sunday school teacher, maybe you know, someone in the choir said, you know, I think you got rid of James. You should, you should be there. And so they set out on their journey, and they do it with such enthusiasm. 
I mean, I, I, I wish you could read some of these early papers. Gosh, they're exciting. They're filled with, oh, I mean, I'm sure Steve and Bob could tell you about all the people who go to the medical school that first day full of excitement. Teachers, those of you who have been teachers, you remember that first day? Man, you had a bucket load of knowledge and you were going to change lives just by the sheer force of your eloquence and personality. And then reality slapped you upside the head. There's a lot of people who start the ordination process who do not finish. That does not mean that God didn't call them. <coughs> that doesn't mean that they are not equipped to love and serve their God. It just means not in that way. A lot of people, well, it's easy to get married. Anybody can do that. You can go down to the courthouse and do a few minutes of paperwork. And I don't know what marriage license cost in Colorado, but probably not that much. But being married, that's a challenge. Paul is saying, Being a Christian is easy. Saying you're a Christian is easy. It's, it's simple enough. All you have to say is, well, depending on which tradition, I believe in God. I believe in Christ. I believe all kinds of things. But it does come down to you. You say that. And then, and then, what happens next? Because ultimately, you have to decide okay, I, I've made this claim, I've made this statement. <coughs> I've done whatever the hoops are you think are required to be a member of a local church or a local denomination or a religion. But there's something else here. Paul is telling us, don't confuse religion with spirituality. Don't confuse faith with church. All of those terms are important and have their place. But even if all the churches in the world vanish tomorrow, if all of the copies of the scriptures suddenly lost. Paul is saying the kingdom of God will endure. Mm -hmm. Because God's love will endure. And wherever God's love is, God's people can be found. And wherever God's people can be found, the gospel <coughs> is being written. When we live the gospel message, when we take it from the printed page and engrave it on our hearts, we say, this matters to me. And because it matters to me, I am going to live someone who is not afraid to die. Because I know that all of this, those passages that we love 
and those passages that we like to skip over all point us in the direction of people who have struggled to live in God's love. <coughs> Paul is saying to us this morning, centuries after the fact, with all that you have, with all that you are, with all that you desire, place it within God. Follow your heart and mind into the presence of God. And when you step into that light and you feel yourself being renewed by the presence of God's Spirit, and all the things that you have devoted your life to, worthy though they may be, are given new meaning and new expressions and new everything. Because suddenly we see them living When I was in seminary, I found a cemetery in Washington, D.C., and it was behind a church, but it had become kind of a dump. And I'm not sure exactly why I started doing it, but it took me about 18 months to clean it up, basically a yard at a time. And one thing that I discovered Every few feet, I would un uncover another marker. Some of the markers just have a first name. One that always sticks out in my mind is Baby Mary. No date, just the name. I uncovered a few wooden markers with a, a metal hoop around a wooden Brain, wooden plaque. The writing long since that faded away. And it occurred to me that every one of those people, every single one, either had dreams of their own or were known and loved by some. Every single one had a story to tell. Every single one was known by God. Names long since forgotten. Dreams and hopes long since banished. Possessions lost or given away. Thrown in the trash. But each one of those people in that cemetery, in fact, every person that you see today is living and breathing and existing in the presence of God. Paul doesn't say, God only loves you if God only blesses you when. God only knows who you are if. Paul says to the church in Philippi, I believe that the gospel has lived in the person of Jesus, shared with me by those who lived and walked with him. I 
believe that that truth, that way of living, is worthy of my devotion. Such that I, I live and breathe and hope. dream of the day when you too can live within the presence of the empire, knowing that when the empire is faded away, God's love will be there to welcome you home. He says, don't wait. Why wait for someday? He says, why not live within God's love now with the recognition that this way of life, this, this gospel way, be yours if you let it. Amen. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as you are able <laughs> as we sing together oh, Jesus I have promised.